So I just want to welcome you all this evening uh, to our first uh, lecture in our Irish Studies Seminar Series. And this is a joint lecture uh, because of the subject matter and because of Professor Margaret Kelleher's interest also in the Irish language. And we thought it was a really nice way of combining uh, both series. Um, and the other series that we run in the school is Ochracht Ga Twitter. So just to welcome you all here this evening and great to see so many. Uh, it's lovely, despite the fact that we are all parted at the moment through our screens in a way it also brings us together in a way that we couldn't come together perhaps if we were in um, a physical building. So in, in some ways there are some advantages uh, that we can all have the advantage of hearing um, this wonderful talk this evening. Uh, this is in the uh, this is being hosted by the School of Irish Celtic Studies and Folklore. Uh, I am Regina E. Holotain. I'm the head of the School of Irish Celtic Studies and Folklore. And this series is run by Dr. Cahal Billings, who is the director of the Lar Onod the Waldriha Dalian Nagelica, and who is over the Tract Twitter series, in conjunction with Dr. Aoife Whelan, who is the head of Irish Studies in the School of Irish Celtic Studies and Folklore. And uh, as everybody was running from teaching classes this evening as well. Uh, I am doing the introduction, but Cahal and Aoife are here also, and they will come in at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker this evening, and we are absolutely delighted to invite uh, Professor Margaret Kelleher, the Chair of Anglo-Irish Literature, to this um, wonderful occasion this evening. We have tried before this to, to organise this event, and unfortunately, the global pandemic got in our way as it has done for many of us. So we had intended for this to be a seminar series uh, in UCD with a wonderful event and perhaps even a reception. And um, But we have our own reception here this evening and we can enjoy in our own uh, our own living rooms for me, in your own rooms, wherever you are. But it unites us all in one uh, lovely communal aspect of looking at uh, and hearing uh, this wonderful talk from Margaret. Professor Margaret Kelleher is the Chair of Anglo-Irish Literature and Drama at University College Dublin. She is the board member of the Museum of Literature of Ireland, Molly, it might be known better to some of you, and was the academic lead for UCD in the foundation of this landmark public humanities initiative and collaboration with the National Library of Ireland. She is chair of the board of the Irish Film Institute and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. In spring 2020, she was the Fulbright Visiting Scholar at Glucksman House, New York University, and is currently working on a joint biography of Mary and Porrick Column. I can't believe that she's already working on another piece after the acclaim in which this wonderful work has been um, has been received. The Man Trasna Murders, Language, Life and Death in 19th Century Ireland was published by UCD Press in 2018. In spring 2019, it was awarded the Michael J. Durkin Prize for Books in Language and Culture by the American Conference for Irish Studies and was shortlisted for the Michelle Dion Prize. So without further ado, and if you could all mute yourselves and just take note of the options for viewing the screen to your top right, I would ask you to please welcome uh, Professor Margaret Kelleher. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, Gerd Mila, uh, Regina, Agus, um, Gambwi Kaslap, Agus Lesh the Kovodori, a Sokton Faltisha, Agus and Shansha, a Mukud Kaida, a a Kur, um, Son Sono Kaidsha. Um, I'm delighted with the opportunity to, to speak to this uh, group. Um, already I took a look at the list of participants, and it's such a pleasure to see old friends from very different contexts. And, and some new friends. So looking forward uh, very much to your comments uh, and, and questions at the end. 
Um, as Regina said, I'll be using a PowerPoint, so you may find it more comfortable. Um, colleagues were uh, reminding us earlier just to choose um, the show thumbnail video um, option, sorry, excuse me, show active speaker video option, um, which will give you, uh, I think, a chance to see uh, more of the PowerPoint because there's, there's quite uh, a lot of detail. I may go to a bit of a clip, so apologies um, if I do that. Um, I was half joking and seriously saying to uh, colleagues beforehand that if anyone wants to know more, uh, there is the option to buy the book. <laughs> Noel Moore and, and Connor Graham, uh, colleagues in UCD, would encourage me to say that. But also, I'd be very happy um, if anyone wants to email me privately afterwards, you know, to share any further detail. And also delighted to say that thanks to uh, the school you know the recording will also be available um, but please if there's detail I've skipped over and you'd like to correspond with me about it subsequently uh, I'd be delighted. I'm going to start with three I suppose sorts of epigraphs and in a way given the context of this audience uh, and particularly perhaps looking to students um, who may be looking for future research projects uh, I thought it might be interesting at times to talk a little behind the scenes of this project some of the choices and some of the challenges for me um, in the research and in particular to point you know work that I think still quite urgently needs to be done this, and I'm, I'm, I'm really indebted to my good friend Patricia Coughlin, who first really kind of led me to this in terms of looking at the definition of mom in the wonderful and um, folklore Gaelga uh, Gasperla. I see a couple of colleagues here from the wonderful Ira Kirkaguina course, which I've attended over many summers, and indeed Deneen often features uh, in those conversations. But the definitions that he makes available include mom as a yoke, bond, duty, service, oppression, a mountain pass, fovom and kruhan, under the yoke of oppression, dov, gaka, mama, an oxen of all work, and I suppose particularly relevant um, to this evening's talk, mom trasna, a mountain pass, a breach, also a place name, Galway. Um, the, the second epigraph I wanted to share is from a, a woman called Doris Summer, a, a critic in Harvard University, who writes very powerfully on bilingualism. Uh, and she made this comment in 2004, and I think it continues uh, to be very relevant on the world stage, where she makes the point that some educators and politicians consider non-elite bilinguals to be damaged raw material that needs to be pressed into simple and transparent form before it can bear complexity. In many ways, I think Summer is pointing to a sort of paradox there that often in cultures, so-called elite bilingualism is seen as something to be cherished and encouraged but non-elite bilingualism, particularly I think when it's associated with new migrants and generations of migrants to a culture can be seen to be threatening. Um, and I think a point um, that is all the more valid in our current situation as we're seeing really in the world sphere unprecedented levels of migration. Uh, and I'll come back indeed to that point at the end. And the third, I suppose, epigraph I have is from an essay by Roland Barth, Mythologies. Now, Barth is writing here in the 50s about another miscarriage of justice. In, in this case the, case, the case of a farmer called Gaston Dominici, a Provençal farmer who was wrongfully convicted of murder um, in France in, in the 1950s. And it was absolutely accepted at the time and subsequently um, that Dominici's inability to understand the formal register of, of French in the courtroom and indeed the inability of the courtroom to understand his Provençal um, speech played a factor in the miscarriage of justice. Uh, and writing about that case um, in the 1950s, Barth goes on to say, I think, again, a point that continues to reverberate over at the centuries. He, he says, the appearance of justice in the world of the accused is possible thanks to what he calls an intermediary myth, which can be made good use of by officialdom, court of assizes, literary tribunals, and that is the myth of the transparency and the universality of language. 
And then he goes on to say, whatever the degree of the accused guilt, there has always been the spectacle of a terror by which all of us are threatened, that of being judged by a power which will hear only the language it lends us. That's really the last, I suppose, theoretical concept I, I want to use as a sort of framing device um, this evening, but it really gestures to something that I'll come back to at the end, which is that that terror of being judged by a power which will hear only the language it lends us has not gone away and continues, I think, to be a challenge in our legal courts, both in Ireland and internationally, uh, in relation to the right, rights of so-called uh, minority speakers, in other words, people who speak a language other than the language of the court. So it's really that international sphere I, I, I want to invoke from the beginning, uh, and I'll come back to that uh, at the end. I suppose, in a way to begin with a sort of ending as well, this is an event I think many of you will remember um, over two years ago now, it's hard to believe, um, when um, the President Higgins gave a pardon, a posthumous pardon to Miles Joyce. Um, and again, I suppose, uh, just for anyone who's new to the case of the Mam Traster murders, Miles Joyce was wrongfully convicted, and I'll come back to this, in 1882, and it took until 2018 for a posthumous pardon to be granted. Only the second posthumous uh, pardon, indeed, in the history of our state, Harry Gleason being the first. And also, many of you might remember, it, it made the news because it involved um, also the very first pardon to be given to a conviction that happened in a different jurisdiction. Miles Joyce was convicted in 1882 um, under um, uh, British law. So it was quite, I suppose, a, a, a cause celebre. And again, happy to answer more questions about that. Very happy to credit the role of uh, our colleague in UCD, Dr. Neve Howland, um, whose report played a key part in the decision by the Attorney General to recommend that a pardon should be given and especially to credit long-standing work by Sean O'Caron, who's also written so well about the Mam Trasna case, and also the late Jarlett Waldron, a parish priest in the area and also historian um, who published one of the first studies. I especially want to mention the man on the right, Johnny Joyce, who became a close friend of mine um, over the years. Uh, Johnny Joyce um, is a great, was indeed a, gr a great grandson of the murdered man, John Joyce. I'll, I'll come back to that in a few moments. Um, sadly, Johnny left us uh, a year ago and it's always impossible for me subsequently, you know, really to give a talk uh, with, without showing his image and celebrating the key role he played in securing justice for the man who had been wrongfully convicted uh, for the murder, indeed, of Johnny Joyce's own, own family members. It's a, 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 a wonderful, a, a very inspiring man. This is the text of the pardon, uh, which was given in 2018. Um, I, I won't stay with that detail for very long, but again, I'll come back to it happily in the questions, if there are questions. But I deliberately put pardon, I suppose, in, in quotation marks, because it does beg that question, can one be pardoned for a crime one hasn't committed? Uh, and there's a way in which the Irish word mahunus, with at least some of the resonances of mahunus, to make good may, may be the, the better word. That in 2018, um, finally, there was a sort of making good uh, whereby Miles Joyce's conviction was found, uh, and this was a crucial detail, unsafe according to the standards of the time. So this evening, I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus on, on a couple of, of dimensions from the book. And as I say, apologies if, if it's a bit of a, a, a whirlwind tour. And, and I, I can see from the attendance, you know, many of you have interests in, in maybe different aspects of the case. So again, very happy to come back to any detail. But I'm going to start with the topic of language shift talk about the murders, the trials, the executions, and then crucially, the question of afterlives and, and really what I was aiming and to signal in the subtitle for this evening's talk, you know, why this case continues to matter.
I think we all can, I suppose, identify with the sense that often the questions that interest us are autobiographical. And this is certainly the case for me many years ago, and I, I'm sure so many of us did this, you know, we looked eagerly at the uh, census records for our family made available in a wonderful act of public humanities and um, by the National Archives as, as a free resource. And there I found the census form from 1911 for my father's family and the Kellehers. And hopefully you can see there uh, my great grandfather who was 73 in 1911. Again, I had worked on the famine earlier in my career for many years, decades indeed, without actually realizing that my great grandfather was born in round about 1838, was a famine survivor um, in North Cork. Um, I knew my grandfather, his son. Uh, and then when you think of, of that in terms of, I suppose, social memory, one realizes that the famine in my family was just two stories away. I knew my grandfather, who knew his father. My grandfather in 1911 was 17, um, a general labor as was his father. I suppose for me, one of the big, um, again, I suppose, Kind of, I still find it very moving detail, um, is that my great grandfather uh, is listed here as unable to read or, or write. My great grandmother could read only, and then my grandfather could read and write. And there was always a family story that my grandfather was a beautiful writer. And it really took me until seeing the census form to realize the pride there must have been, you know, in the family. My late aunt who passed away in 2016 was horrified that I was parading my family history in such a way. But for me, it's a very honorable story. Uh, and, you know, the opportunities that were extended to me, uh, thanks to public education and um, that weren't available to my great grandparents. But obviously you've probably anticipated the crucial detail for this evening, which is language that my great grandparents are listed in 1911 as bilingual and their children as um, English only. And one sees really the language shift in action in my family in that way. And I had, hadn't any expectation and that my great grandparents living in Drumahan in North Cork were bilingual, you know, as late as 1911. Down the road were the Aherns. Um, uh, Margaret Ahern, after whom I named, is uh, was my is is here my future grandmother. Uh, she would some years later marry Michael Kelleher four miles away. Um, in 1911, she's listed as a scholar. Um, and her, her parents are, are somewhat more well-to-do. Uh, my great-grandfather uh, is listed as a railway gateman. And my favorite detail is my great grandmother is listed as head of family. So uh, as a friend said to me, strong women go right back in the, the Kelleher uh, uh, Hearn family. But again, you can, and you can see there, uh, my great uh, grandparents on, on this side were literate and are listed as speaking English only. But there are two children, Margaret and Morris, um, known as Mossy in the family, who are scholars who are going to school in 1911, are listed as speaking Irish and English, as is own Carol, uh, a farm labourer um, living with them uh, at the time. And you can also see there that the possession, I suppose, of a language by the children that wasn't possessed by the parents, which if we think about it in social terms, is actually relatively unusual. Um, gave the census enumerator pause for, for comment. Uh, and there's a comment there in the margin that these three are taken as Irish and English. I suppose the point here is that my great grandparents were sufficiently proud and really invested in their children learning Irish in Drumahan in 1911 as to make sure to list it really carefully in the census form. And I suppose there, in a way, one has two forms of, of, of bilingualism existing simultaneously, an inherited bilingualism from my great grandparents that then wasn't passed on to the next generation, and really a form of acquired bilingualism. Um, um, uh, if, and, and maybe that's to overstate it, we could debate that, but, but certainly uh, a competence um, in Irish as well as English being listed here. 
and in a great act of hubris, I'm going to compare the Joyce family with, or sorry, the Kelleher family with one family of Joyce's in 1901, when John Stanislas Joyce took care to list his son, James Augustine Joyce, the future novelist, and indeed um, Joyce's brother, Stanislas Joyce, as <clears throat> bilingual. Now, one can certainly see there that this is as much maybe paternal pride <laughs> and, and aspiration um, as it is social reality. And it certainly reminds us, you know, that census forms um, can be aspirational, but I think they can also be a really important source of language affiliation. Uh, and, 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 and I mentioned them in that context. I spent a lot of time working on the census material for this book. You know, originally, I, I suppose I shared what can often be quite a widespread view that because the individual schedules don't survive for earlier than 1901 and 1911, there can then be the view um, that the 19th century census material is very limited. But because for much of the century, information is given at the level of barony, it, it sometimes is, I think, quite useful and quite valuable um, information. And even when one takes it in a, I suppose, a sort of national level, um, as in these kind of very overall figures here, I think you can, one can see important points. For example, um, that 38,121 in 1891 for Irish only speakers is often quoted, quoted by Breen O'Keefe and many others as the near death of the Irish language. And obviously I put that in heavy quotation marks. Um, but the figures that are often less often, I think, explored, for example, would be the figure for, for bilingualism. In other words, people who self-registered as late as 1891 as, as um, speaking Irish and English. And in 1891, that's 13.6 of the population. It's a significant percentage, 13.6 of the population. Um, the mathematical of you might have already just noticed some aberrations there. If you see in 1881, if, if you compare 1871 and 1881, um, the uh, increase in bilingual speakers is much larger than the related decrease in Irish only speakers. Uh, and that's because it's conventionally now recognized um, that the figures for Irish speakers up to 1881 are understated. And the question about language moved into the body of the form um, only in 1881. In 51, 61, 71, it was a footnote to a question on education. But I think it's still worth celebrating um, that it was asked so early. The question of language, which was asked, albeit in a footnote in 1851, was actually one of the first European countries for the question to be asked, thanks in large part to William Wilde. And um, the question was asked, in Scotland for the first time in 1881 and in Wales in 1891. I have to say wickedly, I once said this at a forum um, in Wales and they were quite indignant, <laughs> used as they are to being the good Celtic child. <laughs> they were quite indignant, but that is the case that the, the question about language was asked much earlier, albeit in a crude forum. And I suppose for, for students um, at the seminar this evening, it's really a larger point to say, I think there is much more to be gleaned actually from the census information um, than might be thought, particularly when one drills down a little. And you can see here in 1881, which is the relevant figure for, for um, the Mam Trasna case. Uh, Mam Trasna um, was um, in 1881 located in Galway. The county boundaries changed in the 1890s and it became part of Mayo. But in 1881, it was listed in Galway. And in, in 1881, 60, almost 65% um, of the population were Irish speakers. Obviously, the, the vast majority were self-registered, self-declared as Irish speakers, vast majority bilingual, but still a significant a speaking Irish only. Um, one of my own self-realizations about this case is that when I began to research it, I used to refer to people who spoke only Irish and mea culpa on that, I would now say people who speak Irish only. Um, and it's particularly significant when one looks at the barony of Ross, where one sees there that 89% of the barony spoke Irish and about half of those 45% spoke Irish only. In other words, the milieu in which Miles Joyce lived, 
until 1882 was an area where almost 90% of the people in his immediate vicinity spoke Irish and about half of those spoke Irish only. I sometimes wickedly say, think to myself and say it aloud here, that, that those who were isolated in that community were the 10% who spoke English only, and though clearly made a more socially um, uh, um, uh, adv advantaged. This is just one of, I suppose, a number of images one could provide of the very beautiful Mom Trasna, uh, the mountain pass. Just to talk very quickly um, about the key events and, and apologies, I, I know many of you attending the seminar know these details very well, but just really, I suppose, in the spirit of inclusion for anyone who's new um, to the case. Um, on the evening of the 17th of August, uh, five members of the Joyce family were brutally killed. John Joyce, his wife Bridget, who was his second wife, uh, John was a widower and Bridget was stepmother uh, to his children. Um, his elderly mother Margaret, um, who we think was in her 80s, um, uh, was brutally killed, as were John's teenage children, um, Michael and Peggy. The only child to survive the horrific events in the house that night was uh, John's son, Patsy, who was, um, we now think, uh, maybe seven or eight years of age. Um, and John had one other son, Martin, who was out of the house that night, who was working uh, for a local neighbour. Martin um, proved to be the grandfather of John, Johnny Joyce, whose image I shared with you at the beginning. And so there's a very, I suppose, powerful uh, link for Johnny Joyce with the story that if, he's, if, he's, if his grandfather had been in the house that night, he would undoubtedly also have been murdered. Some of the very brutal details that hit national and indeed international headlines very quickly were that the uh, men, or indeed I should say probably man and teenage boy, um, were shot, whereas the women um, were bludgeoned to death. In the succeeding days, 10 men were arrested and ultimately three were executed, including Miles Joyce. Five men were sentenced to life in prison and two men famously turned Queen's evidence. They became informers against the others or approvers was the title at the time. And I suppose to, to pause for a moment there, when I began to research the case, I obviously knew that Miles Joyce and one of the most infamous details um, of the case is that Miles Joyce uh, spoke Irish only, and I, I'm convinced by that. Um, but what I discovered is, is that the language competence of the accused was in fact very varied. And Anthony Philbin and Thomas Casey, who had spent big, significant periods of time in England as migrant labourers, were, were comfortable uh, functioning um, in English. Anthony Philbin, in fact, had, had a degree of literacy in English. Um, and one can, I suppose, see already that that, I suppose, competence in English gave them options that weren't available to particularly um, uh, uh, somebody like Miles Joyce. So in other words, who spoke what language mattered hugely um, in this case. And the language competences that the men had were varied. There can sometimes be a, a sort of a blunt summary that none of the men spoke any English, none of the men accused, which actually isn't the case. And I, I think in a, in a way, the language story by virtue of being mixed is, is in a way more significant. I think it's more salutary in, in many ways for our times. The chief prosecution witnesses were Anthony Joyce and John Joyce, who were also monoglot speakers of Irish. And as emerged in the course of the trials, which took place in November in Dublin, it emerged that those men were first cousins, not alone of the murdered John Joyce, but also first cousins of the accused Miles Joyce. So the case comprised three sets of first cousins, John Joyce, the murdered man, um, the, um, the key prosecution witnesses were another group of, of cousin of uh, uh, another uh, 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 kind of Huey, and, and then finally um, Miles Joyce. The trials took place in Dublin, the executions took place in Galway in December, very rapid, I think surprising in our own time, 
And of the five men who were sentenced to life in prison, two of them died in prison and three, Miles Joyce's brothers, <coughs> Martin and Pauline, and uh, Pauline's son, Thomas Joyce, who was only in his early 20s um, when he was arrested, convicted and imprisoned, they were released in 1902, having served 20 years. These are, image, are photographs that I, I took just a couple of years ago and give you a sense of how the homestead looks um, in, in the present day. Uh, and the, the, the stone wall there on, on the left hand side in the foreground marks the original homestead. Uh, it was never lived in uh, again. The land was farmed a generation later, um, but never um, lived in again. I mentioned this next source um, in a way as an example of the sort of source I had to get past. Um, and I, I think you'll see what I mean when I read it. It is incredible to believe that human beings could live in a, such a hovel as that where the murder was committed. It resembles much more a rude cavern in a rock, so cramped for room and destitute of light and ventilation as the house is. This is from um, John Spencer, the Lord Lieutenant Viceroy, known as Red Earl, basically the British government's um, you know, uh, most senior representative in Ireland, writing to Queen Victoria, having visited the homestead himself in September 1882. In fact, Spencer took a sort of personal interest in the case. Um, but as, as I say, it's, you know, in many ways, a, a conventional source, um, 19th century, um, uh, you know, sources are full of accounts like that, but it tells us nothing about what it was like um, to live there. And, you know, I suppose to use an adage to give you an example of what I mean, one of the most uh, frequent adjectives used to describe the Mount Trasna area was that it was remote. But of course, an area is never remote to the people who live there. And, and one of the challenges for me in the book, and I actually don't think I met it, I, 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 I think I recognized it and I partially addressed it, but I, I don't think I fully succeeded, was to try to turn the lens and, and, and try to see the case, you know, from the point of view uh, of the protagonists, in, in, in this case, mostly men, that I'll come back to the question of women later. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I succeeded, but I suppose I did want to set myself that question. And actually, I'm just going to skip ahead for a second. In a funny way, one of the sources I think that comes closest is this one. It's still, it's still a, um, you know, um, a, a formal source. It's actually a, a sort of blueprint, really, of the house, a floor plan that was drawn by a young engineer who was brought, <clears throat> or sorry, sent by, you know, the state administration to Mount Trasna to draw this. So he would have done the sketching uh, and then his colleagues back in Dublin, you know, would have would have made these kind of coloured maps uh, and 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 they're to be found um, in the National Archives in in the in the kind of prosecution brief, um, but I find it actually a very moving image because it it gives you know in in all its simplicity really an, an image of the home where these people lived and you can see the dimensions you can see that the barn is is relatively large. It's, it's much bigger um, than the, 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 the bedroom and um, that the cow house just has, you know, a partial partition from the rest of the house because people kept their assets indoors. Um, the kitchen is where, um, uh, uh, you know, was the main room of the house. The recess bed uh, on the right corner as you're looking there is where the married couple would have slept and the rest of the family members slept in the room, as you can see in kind of the foreground there. Um, but as I say, I'm, I'm not even sure I can explain it well, but for me, it, it's almost the closest I could come in, in the limits of official sources, which of course are, and again, we could talk about this more, are in English. A question that obviously so often people have is why did the crime take place? Because I want to foreground some of the language issues this evening, I'm not going to stay at this in, 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 in too much detail, but I suppose, you know, the closest one can come, and I would have talked to Johnny Joyce about this a lot over the years, is, is a form of jealousy or competition. John Joyce uh, was, was um, beginning to gather 
um, qu uh, quite a large leasehold. Um, his his uh, new wife was herself a widow uh, with a significant lease in her own right. Uh, and I think there's quite a bit of evidence that he was increasingly falling foul of another strong man in the area, uh, a, a man called Casey, who was actually taken up by the RIC in the days after the crime uh, and questioned, but was never formally charged. Um, and in many ways, I think it, it belongs to, I suppose, just those social forces that Brandon McSivna, I think, traced so well in the end of Outrage, um, his book about, uh, in many ways, comparable events in, in, in Donegal. But the other word I wanted to put with it is, is fear and terror, because when I read about the case, um, you, uh, when I did my own opening research and read about the case, I... I kind of always thought of the Joyce homestead as being absolutely isolated from any others. But in fact, when you go to see the ruins of the house, you can see that the house was on really a sort of street, where a sort of Schreibwalle, where there were actually a number of houses along the road that certainly were in hearing distance. And I suppose to put it bluntly, neighbours must have he heard the cries of distress and, and the violence you know, that was practised that night. Um, and, and didn't, um, didn't intervene. And that, that's why I suppose some of these sources, you know, become so eloquent. I, I used newspaper sources um, uh, a lot in the book. And you can see here, this is an account from the Freeman's Journal in the days after the murders, where the journalist reports on the fact um, that the resident magistrate um, had sought the assistance from local women to nurse the unfortunate lad, that's Patsy, the young boy. And to finish the quotation there, he offered any reasonable sum as remuneration, but no one would volunteer for the duty, um, that the local women wouldn't actually help the injured boy. And uh, he was tended um, by the RIC in, in, in a local hut. Uh, and I suppose the other source I just want to put with this um, is one indeed from our own wonderful um, collections, uh, the Knusa Boilitz Erin, the National Folklore Commission. Um, there aren't actually many accounts about Mam Trasna there, but this is one of the ones um, that is available. And I'll maybe read the translation in English first uh, and, and then the, the original Irish. It's, it's a 1944 account. Um, from Martino Duha from Ross, who was 60, around 60, I think, in 1944, so born two years after the events. And this is a story passed on to him. Well, they went out outside the door then, and they stood outside the door, and the old woman asked the young woman who was his wife. His mother asked the woman if she recognized the men who did the murder, and she said that she recognized each and every one of them. The men returned inside then, they murdered them all except for one young lad who hid himself in a barrel. Well, Kuikshi the Mak Teva Mak on Doris and Sin, August Yasadar Teva Ma on Doris, August Diafrig on Tanvan on Van Og, Gavian Session, Diafrig of Vahar Gavan, Er Athnik Shi Nefer and Rinigan Varu, August Dorchi Gur Athnik Shi Gakil Kyanaka, Dil Nefer Ishtakan Shin, Agus Farik Shid Frey Kale Eid, Kesmithagon in Stoke Gawan, a Kuik Shias in Marilla Alm. In many ways, it's quite a grotesque story, isn't it? I mean, it's it's grotesque in its detail. And um, because in, in a way, it's it it I suppose again I find myself almost stuck for words for this, but it is very striking that the story that's passed on um, in the community is an effort to explain. A, a, a sort of try, an effort to try and almost explain the, the kind of inexplicable. Um, and, and the story is that the intention of the men was to frighten the men, that the, the violence got out of hand, that the men were about to leave, and uh, that then they overheard the women saying that they had identified them and they went back in and killed the women. I mean, in many ways, it's a kind of a grotesque sort of re retrospective justification. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, I think, uncomfortable um, source, but it is, I think, really striking. And I, I don't mean this in a judgmental way at all. I, I, I mean it in the actually kind of empathetic way that a, a community that has had to deal with this really brutal story from within its own community, that it is the violence against the women 
is 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 the story that the kind of on you know the, the the awful story to be at some level kind of unraveled and obviously i'm thinking very much of the wonderful work by angela burke and others of of of, of the way in which you know these kind of troubling stories and that there's an effort to kind of come to terms with them. And my apologies, my, my kind of gloss on this is, is very insufficient and has such the, the kind of, what would you say, um, you know, the advantage of remoteness, but I suppose that the source in a, in a way speaks for itself. One last detail you can see in some of the other maps from the area and perhaps can see it more clearly in this next map is how close the houses were to each other, that the murdered family and the key prosecution witnesses and those who were guilty and those who were wrongly convicted lived in the same area. Uh, and the reverberations of that certainly um, continue to the present day. If we move to the trial, I'll just speak for about maybe five minutes about the trial, just remind you ahead again of, of, of the statistic I mentioned earlier that Miles Joyce lived in a community where you know, um, some 90% of his immediate community um, spoke Irish. Miles Joyce was perhaps 40, we think, um, when these events took place. This is an image of him from um, the Invincibles file, a wonderful file that's been digitized by the National Library in recent years that includes Fenian prisoners and others. And um, actually only relatively recently and um, did it come to light um, that it includes pictures of all of the man trust and accused, the other, the other men um, are there. Um, this again is an, uh, uh, an image from the time. Um, it's an image that appeared in the graphic, um, the English illustration um, magazine in December. And it's, a, it's an image of the courthouse. It's, a, I suppose, again, I think a very, a very powerful um, image, not least because it shows uh, the evidence of Patsy, the young boy, uh, and the dismissal of Patsy's evidence, um, who was held uh, certainly by the prosecution council uh, to not understand the nature of an oath meant that Patsy was made to stand down um, and Patsy's evidence um, would have been crucial for the defence because Patsy's evidence was um, that the men had translation to English blackened faces. Um, in other words, that he couldn't identify the men who came into his home that night uh, and killed his family members. Whereas the argument of the prosecution witnesses, Anthony and John Joyce and um, Anthony's son, was that they could identify the men from a, a field away. So Patsy's evidence was crucial and he was made to stand down. Uh, again, one of the things I found in my own research is that a month before the trial took place, Patsy had successfully sworn under oath an affidavit at a solicitor's office with the use of um, an, uh, an interpreter. Um, um, uh, and so I think, you know, that argument is, is a very specious one. But this, I suppose, from the point of view of language, I know key in, in interest, you know, for those attending the seminar this evening, I think this is probably one of the most fate, fateful moments. Uh, this is the beginning of Miles Joyce's trial. At this stage in the proceedings, two of the men had been convicted, a man called Patrick Joyce, and a man called Patrick Casey and Miles Joyce's trial was beginning and the Freeman's Journal who which ran you know day um, every day a, a whole page spread of the case included this detail which strikingly is not in the court transcript. The Attorney General asked the Learned Counsel for the Defence if the prisoner understood English. Mr Concannon replied that he thought he did not and that it might be better to have the evidence of the witnesses who speak English interpreted to the prisoner in Irish. It's worth pausing on that. The defence counsel wasn't sure as to Miles Joyce's language competence. The interpreter asked the prisoner in Irish if he understood the evidence that was being given in English and informed the court that the prisoner replied in the affirmative. Again, I think one can see what's happened here. The interpreter, a man called Evans, an RIC constable, actually from the, the Galway area, um, asked Miles Joyce in Irish if he understood. Miles Joyce replied in Irish that yes, he understood um, the interpreter. And the interpreter replied 
he yes you know he 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 understands and the judge took that to mean that Miles Joyce understood English and the services of the interpreter were suspended from Miles Joyce for the remainder of the trial with the exception of translating the evidence of the prosecution witnesses who were testifying in Irish and, and again I pause on that point because I think for very good motives there's sometimes a, a simplistic um, version of the case that there wasn't an interpreter. In fact, it's worse. There was an interpreter present in the courtroom um, who had the ability to translate Miles, for Miles Joyce and his service was suspended until the giving of the verdict. And the next day, the, the jury retired for six minutes to ponder um, Miles Joyce's guilt, so-called guilt, and, and they returned. And again, this is an account I think a very moving account from the Freeman's Journal um, on the on the the, the 20th um, of November, uh, where Evans is called back. It basically became clear to the to the judge um, and to the um, the court at large that Miles Joyce didn't understand the verdict when it was given in English, and the interpreter was called back, and and his um, his his. He then, for the first time, was given the right of statement um, under legal process at the time. Um, the accused did not have the right to testify on their own behalf. So this is the first time that Miles Joyce's voice would have been held in the courtroom, obviously available to us, mediated in, in many ways, primarily through the interpreter, who also we'll see here translated his um, account into the third person. Uh, and I, 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 um, I know that there are a number present who are studying Irish and law, and there's so much, I think, to be looked at here, including what would now be seen to be unacceptable practice of legal translation, which is the translation of pronouns. It's translated, the Evans not alone translated into English, but translated into the third person. But even at that distance, I think one can hear some of the cadences, even in the kind of Hiberno English here, some of the cadences and syntax of Miles Joyce's fluent Irish. Um, he leaves it to God in the Virgin above his head. He had no dealing with it, no more than the person who was never born, nor had he against anyone else. For the last 20 years, he had done no harm. And if he had, might he never go to heaven? He was as clear of this as the child yet to be born. And so much so that even the Daily Express, um, which was the much more unionist leading newspaper at the time, even it, uh, very unsympathetic to Miles Joyce in political terms, even it recognised in its editor, in its coverage, sorry, on Monday the 20th of November, is that his, um, Miles Joyce's testimony had made a remarkable impression on the court. And what I'm struck by, even in this very, in many ways, very awkwardly phrased comment, um, very condescending at one level comment about the strange, unusual, but sonorous sounds of the mountain Gaelic of Miles Joyce, there is still a recognition, I mean, in this very unsympathetic source that Miles Joyce was fluent in his own language. Um, I, I don't have time to go into this, but in, in the kind of famous account of the case, by James Joyce, the, novel, the young journalist and um, future novelist. In his essay in 1907, he represents Miles Joyce as dumbstruck. But here, you know, in a very unsympathetic um, newspaper source, the fluency of Miles Joyce speaking in a language which many, if not mo most in the court couldn't understand is actually grudgingly acknowledged. That's why I wanted to mention, I suppose, this uh, very um, interesting source, uh, particularly for this audience, um, which is an, a, an account of Miles Joyce's dying words on the scaffold. Miles Joyce was then um, executed less than a month later, and he protested um, to the last. He protested his innocence to the last, so much so that I suppose, in, again, in one of the most infamous details of, of, of the trial, and the rope slipped and Miles Joyce died with strangulation rather than a broken neck. One of the, again, one of the, I suppose, final acts of brutality um, in this incredibly brutal case. But 
In the 1930s, a man called Higginbottom published his autobiography. And Higginbottom in London, he had been, in a way, a kind of young stringer um, for the uh, British press in Ireland. And he attended Miles Joyce's execution. By then, in 1882, executions were private and a jury could attend and some members of the press. And in 1934, he reproduced this source, Miles Joyce's dying words in the sca scaffold, Fuckle Dana Voil Vera Show. Now, when I came across, across it first, I thought it was sort of an Umberto Echo moment, you know, that there was a, a piece of paper with Miles Joyce's last words. But in fact, and again, you can maybe see it a little bit more clearly. Apologies to anybody who might be listening to me and watching this on a, on a mobile phone. Obviously, the recording we, we, will have the, it'll be easier to see the slides. But in fact, from the very kind of formal, even literary nature of, of, of the Irish, I think actually the more likely thing is that Higginbottom had a translation into English of Miles Joyce's words, which then, for the purposes of authenticity um, in his memoir in the 1930s, he had it retranslated into Irish. Um, but it's 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 quite a story in itself, and even the very fact that he was in the 1930s keen to present it as a sort of facsimile, you know, with with a kind of autograph hand rather than a printed hand, is significant. And to complicate the story even further, Higginbottom believed in Miles Joyce's guilt. He actually didn't believe he was innocent. So it's kind of scale on scale there. One other last source I want to mention, and I, 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 I will finish in, 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 in about five minutes. Apologies if I'm, if I'm going too long. And um, this is, I suppose, one of the most, um, I, I suppose, interesting sources as well. Tim Harrington, crusading um, member of parliament, um, who campaigned for the acquittal of the men and later campaigned unsuccessfully for the release of the five men in prison in 1884, published a pamphlet in which he published his the name of the actual murderers. And you can see in the small caps there, now alleged, <laughs> probably entered by a terrified publisher. Quite extraordinary, really, in 1884. And, and he named um, as the murderers um, three men who, who were at large, one of whom was by 1884 in England. He named, I think, convincingly that the two other that the two men tried to convicted before uh, Miles Joyce and executed were guilty, and they had acknowledged that and they they uh, declared that on the eve of their execution. But he says very clearly that Miles Joyce um, and indeed his brothers and John Casey also uh, were innocent. And on the eve of their execution, Patrick Joyce and Patrick Casey had indeed testified to Miles Joyce's innocence as well, but it wasn't sufficient and he was executed. In terms of future work on the case, I think there's a, so much to be done on the plight really of, of, of Irish speaking um, people, you know, into the late 19th century when they encountered the organs of the state, in this case, the legal trial, but also when they encountered imprisonment. I mean, this is a detail by Tim Healy in 1928, when he tells the story of having heard from a warden who was a warden in Kilmainham, where the men were held in 1882, and the warden described the men as not being able to speak English and numbering their children on their fingers and by signs trying to show them their ages and heights. This is 1882 in Kilmainham, and this is the situation of Irish speaking prisoners in Kilmainham. And it's reinforced, and I'm really grateful to Kira Bernock, who led me to this source, that in 1890, uh, uh, really a very heroic man, a uh, Roman ch Catholic chaplain um, to Maryborough, now Port Leith Jail, appealed to the prison board um, in Dublin in 1890 for even a part-time Irish-speaking Roman Catholic clergyman who could administer the sacraments to the man trust of men. This is 1890, um, and he was refused time after time. Uh, and, and the response by the prison board was that they had sent one Irish speaking uh, warden to Port Leash, whose role was to teach the men English. <laughs>
So that means in 1890 in Port Lease Jail, there was, and we have official source for this, there was one Irish speaking um, 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 uh, uh, warden. And yet again, to come back to that statistic I've been using over and over, in the early 1880s, Miles Joyce lived in the milieu where 90% of, of the people around him spoke Irish. And I suppose in many ways, it's for me a plea to those who are interested in particular 19th century history. There's so much work to be done to look at the complexity of usage. And, you know, so many of our figures are very blunt and they don't capture in many ways, I think, what seems to me to almost be one world west of the Shannon and, and another world east of it. And certainly that would have been the case for Miles Joyce. Just to finish, you know, it's hard to find women's voices or indeed images. Um, the image there is a pen portrait by one of the court journalists of some of the female relatives of the accused. And many of them had petitions written on their behalf. Um, um, and, and this is just one example. But um, Martin Joyce, whom I mentioned earlier uh, as the brother of Miles Joyce was one of the men who survived uh, the 20 years in prison. And again, these are pictures of him before and after. They're quite extraordinary. He was in his early 40s when he was admitted to prison and really a, a broken man when he was released in 1902. And I found the census form um, for, his wid for his widow in 1911. He lived only about three years after being uh, released. He, he died in 1906. And I find this, as, again, I suppose, if part of the, I suppose, topic of my, my talk this evening is how do we make official sources speak? You know, I'm dealing with English language sources, but how do we make them speak? How do we read between the lines and behind the lines and under the lines to try and reclaim and the stories of these um, Irish speaking individuals? This, I think, is a, a striking example. Mary Joyce, 29 in 1911. It means that she was born just months before her father was sent to prison. Um, she certainly wouldn't have had a chance to visit him um, in Maryborough, Port Leash. So she would have met him for the first time as a woman in her 20s. Um, and he lived just three years. And again, it's striking in 1911. At this stage, she's living with her mother, um, and her grandmother and all three struggling, the three of them obviously to keep a homestead going and the three of them are listed as speaking um, Irish only. That's 1911. I suppose to finish the, the larger situation I was gesturing to um, and it's something I talk about in the conclusion to the book and, and it's so, certainly something I, I'd really like to do some more work on um, in the years ahead are in many ways, I suppose, to put it very bluntly, the kind of symbolic descendants of, of, of Miles Joyce. We now know from the 2016 census um, that the numbers who speak a foreign language at home, um, you know, have increased significantly. And the wonderful, I suppose, cultural richness in our community and um, that's coming, um, uh, you know, from, from these communities. It's striking that in 2016, the numbers who speak English not well or not at all, were 86,000. That's over 86,000. Highest numbers in absolute terms were Polish, particularly um, uh, people of an older generation, um, perhaps you know, living in Ireland with, with, with their children, um, most likely. And the highest numbers in relative terms were persons from Afghanistan and China. And yet the comment, very powerful comment made in 2010 by Michael Cronin about the absence of, of suitable interpretive services, you know, for these people um, in, in Irish courts, in Irish social welfare situations, in, in all sorts of other public spheres. And the point made by Michael in 2010 um, continue, I think, to be really powerful. For example, a recent report by the Immigrant Council in 2017 showed that in 79% of cases, people had had to act informally as interpreters for family and friends. 
almost 80% of the people um, uh, questioned had had to act informally for, for family and friends with dreadful situations of children, for example, having to interpret for their families in judicial um, or other, you know, official um, circumstances. And I suppose, you know, Michael's point it makes its own case. The situation in many parts of Europe is not much better, but the Irish case is all the more disappointing in that one would have thought that a country which has been bilingual since its inception would display a fair degree of sensitivity to language and translation issues. And I suppose I'll finish uh, with Again, uh, a point made by Kate uh, Walterhouse in an excellent recent book on Ireland's district course showed that um, some years ago, Ireland was actually found to be a cautionary tale in an international study because of the poor quality of interpreters, in experienced, incompetent, and indeed one could say poorly paid interpreters servicing the justice system. And I suppose in a way, I, I made the ethical, um, for me it is an ethical decision some years ago that I wouldn't ever really talk about this case uh, without ending on this point. So Sinead and many thanks um, for your long attention. I hope at least some of you have had a chance to, um, um, uh, to stay with us. <laughs>